The sweating sickness immediately killed some in opening their windows, some in playing with children in their street doors, some in one hour, many in two. As it found them, so it took them. Some in sleep, some in wake, some in mirth, some in care, some fasting and some full, some busy and some idle, and in one house sometimes three, five, more, sometimes all. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History Obscura. I know you all love a good plague story just as much as me, so those of you in the Northern Hemisphere, enjoy the last few weeks of humidity and heat, and hear the tale of the sweating sickness. The year was 1485. It was the final canon year of the Wars of the Roses, in which the unlikely Henry Tudor wrested the crown of England for himself and donned the moniker King Henry VII. The realm was about to undergo serious changes in legislation and administration from the local to national level, not to mention combat the sporadic skirmishes from Yorkist loyalists who were loath to admit defeat after 30 years of fighting for the monarchy. There was a lot to do and a lot going on, and then came a mysterious, new, fashionable disease, the sweating sickness. Specifically, the English sweating sickness. Indeed, as it seemed at first to confine its glorious symptoms to citizens of the tiny island nation only. The sweat began very suddenly with a sense of apprehension. Oh, somebody's very upset. Followed by cold shivers, sometimes very violent, dizziness, headache, and severe pains in the neck, shoulders, and limbs with great exhaustion. The cold stage might last from half an hour to three hours, after which the hot and sweating stage began. After sweating, sufferers then experienced headaches, delirium, rapid pulse, and intense thirst. According to 16th century physician John Caius, symptoms also included quote, marvelous heaviness and a desire to sleep, end quote. In fact, Caius believed that his patients must fight against the desperate urge to sleep, or they would certainly perish. Once such symptoms presented, a person could die in as few as two hours. Generally, however, a full day would pass before death consumed the victims, or they began to recover. In this way, the sweat was similar to the Black Plague. Unusually, however, reports of rash or skin changes were rare, and the disease spread through mostly men of the middle and upper classes, all but ignoring infants and children in favor of middle-aged adults. The 1485 outbreak killed about 15,000 Londoners, of an estimated 50,000, in as few as six weeks. Henry VII, who had been in the midst of planning his politically necessary coronation, was forced to postpone the event in fear of contracting the illness himself and leaving England yet again without a leader. After all, his marriage to Elizabeth of York was still new, and his future heir, Arthur Tudor, had yet to even be born. It was crucial to Henry's political plan that he be officially crowned at Westminster Abbey before England's Parliament met in November of that year, so time was limited. Now, most epidemics in medieval and Renaissance England were concentrated in urban areas, but the sweating sickness extended its reach to the isolated farmlands and rural byways of the countryside as well. This had doctors of the day, as drearily unready for most illnesses as they already were, quite stymied. The good doctor John Caius sniffed at the epidemic, proclaiming that its prevalence was due to the weakness, or as he puts it, womanliness, of the contemporary generation. Go to hell, John. You're not even a real doctor. Anyway, to quote Mr. Caius, 
We are nowadays so unwisely fine and womanly delicate that we may in no wise touch a fish. The old manly hardness, stout courage, and painfulness of England is utterly driven away, in the stead whereof men nowadays receive womanliness and become nice, not able to withstand a blast of wind or resist a poor fish. And children be so brought up that if they not already by day are by the fire with a toast and butter and in their furs, they be straight sick. In short, if men would only live as, again to quote, men were wont to do in the old world when this country was called Merry England, unquote, they wouldn't be so susceptible to the sorts of miasmas that kill within 24 hours. Nevertheless, Caius did trouble himself to prescribe general remedies for the sweat, including herbs such as feverfew, wormwood, and wild tansy. He also believed fervently that the body's own natural response to the illness, that is, sweating, was key to recovery. He told families to provide their ill with warm drinks to promote more perspiration. If the sickness didn't leave its victim with these treatments, Caius threw his hands up and blamed supernatural causes. On the 30th of October, 1485, when the worst of the suffering and death seemed to have passed, Henry Tudor was crowned King of England. The Tudor chronicler, Edward Hall, wrote, He, with great pomp, was conveyed to Westminster, and there the 30th day of October was with all ceremonies accustomed anointed and crowned king by the whole ascent, as well as of the commons and the nobility, and was named King Henry the seventh of that name, which kingdom he obtained and enjoyed as a thing by God elected and provided, and by his especial favor and gracious aspect, compassed and achieved. Sadly, the first heir to the Tudor throne, Arthur, quite likely contracted and died of the sweating sickness, or something similar at least, some mere months after his marriage to Catherine of Aragon. He died on April 2nd of 1502, during one of the five waves of the sweat that passed through England between 1485 and 1551. Catherine herself had also fallen ill, but recovered to find herself widowed in a strange and uncomfortable country at the age of 16. For seven long years, the Spanish princess remained in England with hardly any money to support herself and pay the wages of her ladies-in-waiting. King Henry VII was not disposed to send Catherine back where she came from, as England's positive relationship with the powerful Catholic Spanish states was important to his country's status and safety from French attack. Furthermore, Ferdinand II, Catherine's father, had promised an exorbitant amount of money to Henry VII as his daughter's wedding dowry. So, the English king hung on to the Spanish girl as long as he could, trying to find the most productive way to use her. For a time, that saw Catherine employed as the Spanish ambassador to England, but eventually, of course, she was married off to the king's second son, very shortly after his accession to the English throne as King Henry VIII. Not to worry, Catherine did survive her marriage, unlike several of her successors. The death of Henry VIII's brother, Arthur, to the sweating sickness must have affected him deeply and for the rest of his life. After all, he'd only been ten years old when Arthur died, when in June of 1528 the epidemic appeared once more in London, Henry VIII's famous hypochondria came out in full force. He would submit himself to almost daily examinations by a team of physicians, who would closely inspect everything from his appearance to his bowel movements. He kept a medicine cabinet in his privy chamber that included potions of his own devising. Henry was determined to preserve his health at all costs, and when the sickness appeared in 1528, he told his palace courtiers to flee to the country to avoid infection, as he did himself. 
He was in such haste that he left behind his primary mistress and future wife, Anne Boleyn, to fend for herself. She was said to have contracted the sickness, and so Henry kindly sent his second best doctor to attend her. She did survive, of course, for the time being. Years later, Henry's third wife, Jane Seymour, gave birth to what would be the king's only son to survive infancy, Edward VI. Surely you are quite aware of the importance of a male successor in a monarchy, and in particular the importance of such an heir in the eyes of Henry VIII, who had been waiting three decades to produce anything other than another daughter. In caring for his young male heir, King Henry demanded exacting standards of security and cleanliness in his son's household, stressing that Edward was this whole realm's most precious jewel. The boy was kept outside of London to avoid infectious disease. Henry provided a new wash house at Hampton Court Palace and ordered that the walls, floors, and ceilings of Edward's apartments should be washed down several times a day. Those who attended the prince also had to be scrupulously clean and, of course, free from any sickness. Any servant who fell ill was ordered to leave the household at once. Edward's doting father also commissioned a privy kitchen for his son at Hampton Court in order to ensure that there was no contamination from the main kitchens that served the rest of the household. Once he had been weaned, all of the prince's food was tested by a servant before being given to him. The same care extended to the prince's wardrobe, and his clothes were washed, brushed, and tried on before being worn in case they had been poisoned. These measures seemed to have worked, and Edward did succeed his father as the King of England following Henry VIII's death in 1547. He even lasted through the final wave of the English sweating sickness in 1551. However, a pulmonary illness struck the young monarch in 1553 and killed him a few months later. He was only 15. Many suppositions have been made by modern medical researchers as to just what disease the sweating sickness may have been. Was it a type of malaria? A fever spread by fleas and ticks? Ergot poisoning or rodent spread hantavirus? Perhaps even anthrax poisoning from raw wool or animal carcasses has been suggested. The disease gave up its hold on England after that final 1551 outbreak and though a very similar sickness struck France several centuries later, the English sweat still stands alone as a wholly unique ravage upon the land of the Angles. It may even be that Richard III, on the day of his death at the Battle of Bosworth, whereupon Henry Tudor took the crown to begin his own dynasty, had already fallen victim to the English sweat. Thank you for listening. Hit up our Patreon or buymeacoffee.com to support the show. Good night. Good night.